Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you come upon a a scene of, of chaos or confusion, how you respond to that scene really depends on who you are, what your role is there. So if you're a child and you come upon this scene, assuming you haven't caused the chaos and the confusion, what, what your role is, is you simply find an adult and let them take care of it. Now, if you're a youth leader or a chaperone, you do the same thing. You look around and find an adult. And then you realize that you're supposed to be the adult and you have to do something about it. If you're a doctor, you took an oath to help, and so you have to go into the scene and say, I'm a doctor, I'm here to help. Now, if you're a tour guide, all you have to do is stand to the sideline and and just talk about what you see. Uh, Folks on the right, you'll see some six-year-olds in their natural habitat. It looks like they've taken their kindergarten teacher and tied her up. I wonder what's going to happen. Anyway, on to our next stop. You see, there's kind of a big difference between the way a tour guide has to respond to a situation and a doctor. And I want us to think about that as we consider the brokenness, the need for truth in our world. Because it's really easy for us to simply want to be tour guides, to stand at at arms or or maybe a train's length away from what's going on. Say, hey, you'll see these problems over there. Oh, that's something that needs to be dealt with, but not to actually involve ourselves in what's going on. See, this is actually what comes naturally in our world. Because the idea of truth and love are, are separate, are, are actually incompatible. Now, that, that to love someone is, is really, it's, it's tolerance. Uh, and so that there's not really room for truth in love. So that if you really love someone, you, you're not going to uh, speak your mind, you're not going to tell them uh, your truth, because that might not line up with what they want to hear. So we've taken truth and love, and we've build a divide between the two. And what ends up happening is that people end up suffering. See, when we have love with no truth, what that involves is really ignoring that there are any problems going on at all. Now, imagine if a doctor chose to do that. If a doctor, their their practice was that they only delivered good news. The test results were good, you get to find out about them. The test results were bad, we're just going to sweep that under the rug and pretend like everything's fine. Now, even in, in the secular world where love and truth don't coexist, that doctor would still be fired. Because we recognize that the loving thing to do in that scenario is to tell the truth, even if it's not what the person wants to hear, even if the truth is bad, even if it's hard to swallow. The loving thing to do is to let the person know what's actually going on, that there is a danger, that there are things that perhaps need to change. There is work that needs to be done. That's the loving thing to do in that scenario. See, love without truth can only exist in a world where nothing is wrong, nothing is broken, there are no consequences. And that's just not the world that we live in. See, the reality is there are physical and emotional and spiritual brokenness and consequences and realities. And in this world that we live in, then we have to have love and truth. See, there's so much that we as the church need to speak truth on. I mean, the truth about the creation of the world. God made it through his word in six days. The truth about race 
that we are all made in the image of God. We all have infinite value. The truth about life that from its beginning to end that life matters. From conception to natural end, life has value. The truth about marriage between one man, one woman for life. The truth, truth about sexuality in the context of that covenant marriage. The truth that our sin separates us from God. The truth that there is a judgment. There's so much that we need to speak truth on. And yet at first glance, it doesn't seem like that's the loving thing to do. But when we recognize that there are consequences, there is danger, there is a judgment, and we say nothing, that's not the loving thing to do at all. See, that's just like the doctor that refuses to give bad news to a patient, even if that can lead to their healing. See, love without truth is not really loving at all. Because what happens when we pretend that there are no problems, that nothing's wrong, is that people suffer. And so the other option we have, we kind of swing to the other side and we have truth without love. I mean, if the two things are incompatible, we can't have love without truth, then let's live on the side of truth. And let's insist that regardless of what happens, I'm just going to speak the truth. doesn't matter how I say it. Uh, truth is, is what matters. I mean, I had a conversation uh, with a friend a number of months ago. Uh, it, it actually, it took place, uh, the conversation took place online. Uh, because I broke my one rule about being online. Is, uh, my rule is never, ever, 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 ever. Ever. I think that's the right amount of evers. Uh, never get into a productive conversation online and think you're going to change someone's mind. That's my rule. And I broke my rule because I thought, surely this is the exception uh, to the rule. And uh, because I had a, 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 a friend uh, that uh, I, I, I thought maybe uh, needed to be engaged in a loving conversation about how he was uh, interacting with others. Uh, because what, what was going on is uh, the, the, the names he was using for the people he was talking about, the way he was communicating it, to me, did not reflect uh, the love of Christ. And his response was, well, Jesus offended people, so I can offend people. He says, I, I'm not saying anything that's false. I'm telling the truth, so, so that's what matters. I mean, we can maybe get to that kind of a reading if we ignore the Gospels and particularly the epistle of James where he talks about the power of our tongue. But, but more than that, I mean, what has happened is that the charged rhetoric of our culture, that all that matters is that you're right. And if you're right, you can say it how, uh, however offensively that you want. It doesn't matter what names you call someone else. What matters is if you're right. That justifies whatever words you use to prove that you're right. And so what ends up happening is we as church take the truth and we club it over people to try to argue them into seeing our way of view. And the reality is in that scenario, when we take truth as a club and that's all that matters, we don't really care about the person. We just want to win the argument. We just want to know that we are right. When we have truth without love, what ends up happening is we get so focused on the problems that we lose sight of the people. And when we fo focus so much on the problems that we lose sight of the people, we become the problem. See, we can't have love without truth. We can't have truth without love. As much as our world insists that these two cannot coexist, they cannot exist apart from one another. And so our real directive as church is to speak the truth in love. It's what Paul encourages. He kind of coins that phrase in Ephesians chapter 4. Speak the truth in love. And in a world where these two concepts are opposite one another... 
it's hard to know how exactly do I do that? I mean, what does it look like to speak the truth in love? That's why I'm glad that we have this short letter of 3 John. Because what John does here in this short letter, it's kind of like an email, is he exhibits speaking the truth in love. Here's the, the first verse of 3 John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. From the very beginning, John insists that love and truth are joined together. And he continues on in the text that we read this morning. He encourages this church to walk in the truth. He shows his commitment to them, that he's sending these, these missionaries to them. And that, that they're to, to welcome them, to walk in the truth, to show them love and hospitality as fellow workers of the truth. But right after our reading uh, for today ended in verse 8, John shifts his focus. And here's, here's verse 9 and 10. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. See, John, it takes a moment in, in, from encouraging this church to do what is right, and he honestly addresses, hey, there's a problem going on. One of your leaders is not teaching the truth, is not living out the truth. I mean, John honestly addresses the situation because he loves these people. And, he ha and in, in order to love them, you have to speak the truth when there are things that are going on that are dangerous, that can separate them from the will and the love of God and Christ Jesus. But John doesn't just speak these truths from a distance. Here's verse 10. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. I will come. I will bring up what he is doing. See, speaking the truth in love primarily happens not only face to face, but it happens in the context of a committed relationship. Is to commit to someone, I am coming, I'm going to share the truth, and regardless of how that truth is perceived, you're stuck with me. I'm committed to loving that person. To, I'm not going to change the truth whether if they don't accept it, but I am committed to in the context of a relationship, to share the truth of God, to love and to serve. See, that's speaking the truth in love. It's what John is exhibiting. It's because that's how our God speaks truth and love to us. It's about honesty, but it's also about commitment. Commitment to a person. See, it's not about problems. It's about people. It's not about winning an argument. It's about serving and loving those whom God loves. I mean, there's no one that's more honest with us than God. I, God's word is very clear, very honest, very transparent about who we are. That, that on our own, we are separated from God. We are, are broken we want to worship ourselves rather than God. And the Bible does not pull punches when it comes to the, quote, heroes of the faith. We see almost all of them at their worst, in their rebellion, in their sin. God is honest about who we are. But he's honest about it. So much so that he knows we cannot save ourselves. We cannot fix the problem. And more than about fixing problems, God is about fixing people. God is committed. That's why he sends Jesus to come to this earth and to honestly proclaim the truth. The message of repentance because the kingdom of heaven is near. And how do the people respond to that truth? To Jesus speaking the truth in love? To honestly talking about their condition? They kill him. 
And yet God raises him from the dead because he is committed to us. See, Jesus carries the, our, our dishonesty, our, our sin, our desire to love ourselves rather than our neighbor, rather than our God. And when he pays the price for that on the cross, he's committed to us to honestly think you cannot save yourselves. I am going to do it for you. See, speaking the truth in love ultimately looks like the cross. Where God honestly deals with our sin as he commits to loving us no, no matter what. And when we realize how loved we are by this God who is committed to us, who speaks the truth to us in love, who doesn't run away, who doesn't give up depending on how we respond to that truth, if that changes how we respond to those around us. See, no longer can we be tour guides in the brokenness of our neighbors, of our lives, or in the world. We can't just sit back from a distance and say, oh, look, at, look at this problem. I can't believe that that's wrong. I, I'm going I'm to share on Facebook how terrible this is and just stay from a distance and think that that's what God wants. See, God's called us to speak the truth in love. Oftentimes, it's a truth that isn't what someone wants to hear. It may not be popular with the way of the world. And yet, the loving thing to do as we commit to loving people is to honestly speak the truth. And this requires two things of us. The first is we have to know the truth. We, we can't proclaim the truth if we ourselves don't know it. See, it, this is one of the main reasons why we have Bible study. Here's why we encourage uh, to, to be connected, to be involved. That's why we're walking through the Bible this year. is to know the truth. Because you can't share something that you yourself don't know. So for us to be committed to knowing the truth, to be asking our questions, to be seeking biblical answers because the truth matters. But the second and perhaps more difficult thing for us to do is not just to know the truth, but to commit to speaking that truth in love in the context of a relationship. See, the people that we know, the people that God has brought into our lives that we would be committed to loving them so much that we would speak the truth. We commit to loving them regardless of how they respond to that truth. That we're not going to change the truth because they don't like it, but we're going to continue to love them and serve them because that's what our God does for us. See, instead of a tour guide, we take the attitude of a doctor in those relationships, we say, I'm a Christian. I'm here to help. We don't just lob truth from a distance, but we invite ourselves in. I'm here to help. Or perhaps just, I'm here. Regardless of what happens, regardless of how you respond, regardless of if things get better or worse, I am here. I'm committed to loving and serving and being honest, sharing the truth with you because our God is committed to you as well. I'm a Christian. I'm here. I'm here to help. I want to close with uh, this story of a, of a man who was on an airplane. And he had a, probably a, a similar experience to what many of us have had on, on an airplane. He was on, on a plane, and there was a, an infant child on that plane that was not super thrilled about flying. And so this child was, was using all of her words to let everyone know that she wanted to be back on the ground. And, and it, you know, airplane's kind of an enclosed space, uh, and so uh, this was very, very, very loud. And the mom was frazzled, and she was trying everything she could. The, the flight attendants came over. They tried everything they could. And all that happened is this, this child was screaming louder and louder and louder. 
and what the passengers are doing, they're, they're looking at each other and they're, they're talking about how, how terrible this is for them and oh, I can't believe I got this flight and all these issues. And all of a sudden this man stands up and he walks over to the mom. And she assumes that she's going to get this big lecture about flying with this baby, about not being prepared. What this man does, he says, do you mind if I take a turn? He takes the child in his arms and he walks around and he gently rocks that child to sleep. And as the other passengers hear silence for the first time in seemingly their entire lives, (laughs) one of them goes, sir, thank you so much for what you've done for us. And the man turns and he says, I didn't do it for you. I didn't do it for us. I did it for this child. See, when we speak the truth in love, we're not doing it to lessen the noise in this world. We're not doing it for ourselves so that we feel better. We're doing it for the person. For the person who is crying out and help, who needs the love and the care of Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm here to help. I'm here for you. Because your God is here for you. In the name of Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen.